Um, actually, what brought me to the conference this time was uh, my involvement in my friend Jerry Jampolsky. Um, he had mentioned it to me and had seen a painting I had painted and shared it with Manic, who um, put the conference on. And she loved the work and asked me if I would be part of it and do something special for it. So you did? I did. Why I did. Talk to me about what the, this uh, artwork here. Um, the piece I did for the conference is called Healing um, the Earth, Healing the Self, and Healing Others and um, healing the self, first of all, because the only way that we can have peace on earth is if we each have peace within. When we go out into the world, this is what we offer. So this represents Mother Earth and all of her wisdom, and at her heart is, um, are all of the different people on the planet. These are the rainbow people, the different cultures that um, surround our planet. And at the center is the earth. It's all the same air, all the same water. What goes around comes around. And it's a prayer for um, our earth, um, our self, um, all of the indigenous people on the planet, um, and all of the different monuments and buildings and uh, architecture indicative to many different places on the planet are represented. And coming through the hands is really the love and the offering of um, this message that if we're going to have peace on our earth, we each have to work on finding peace within first. That whatever we have in us is what we take out into the world. And so that's what this painting represents. So talk to me about, let's see what I understand. So the hands are at the bottom there, and there is kind of a source. Is that what we're looking at here? Well, the hands had a very special story in themselves. When I was doing the painting, I normally don't draw things. I normally do everything with a brush. And I wanted the hands to be very symmetrical in the form of a prayer. And they just wouldn't be symmetrical. So I made a little pattern of a half of the hand, and I drew it. And when I turned it over to draw the other hand, when they crossed, what happened was they formed a perfect heart, which wasn't anything planned. It was really the magic part of the painting. So kind of like the signature to me that it was all decided beforehand and that this was truly an offering of love. And so I've actually donated this to the conference. And um, the proceeds will go to help further this cause. Okay, let me understand this figure now. So she's. Who's the, the, this is Earth? The, Earth this Mother. is M Mother Earth. Mother Earth. I would say this is, represents Mother Earth. And at the very heart of the piece is this face, which represents inner peace. And in order to have peace on, on this whole planet, we each have to focus on what's in our own hearts and our own inner peace. It's impossible that most of the guns are in our heads, not out there. So, you know, we're having all kinds of arguments and things going on, our own dialogues in our heads, and we can't be peaceful in the world unless we stop that kind of inner chatter. And so that's why it's actually an observational meditation. Um, but that's what it really represents. It, this is Mother Earth. She's holding the whole planet in her arms, um, embracing all of the green, embracing all of the water, embracing all of the sky, um, because it's all one planet. We have one source of supply on this earth, and we're sharing all of it. And at the very heart of that is the feeling of peace, because in, unless you have a change of heart, you really can't change anything in the world. And so that's what the painting represents. And this is, the pillars represent pillars of wisdom. Gold is the color of wisdom, and um, an arch of love that in order to um, make this bridge and bridge this gap between our heads and our hearts, we have to use a lot of love and look at things in many different ways. About a month before I came to the conference, and it's a, a series that I've been working on um, that I started for my, actually for a painting called Pause for Peace, which is for the <coughs> Millennium, for um, Sister Cities International, and that's what got me in touch with all of the different landmarks and all of the different cities, and um, they began as mandalas. So I've been doing a whole series based on this concept of the whole planet being a whole organism. If you look at all 
your work as a trend, where are you heading towards? What do you foresee in the future for your own work, or do you just let it unfold? I really let it unfold. Um, after all these years, I've realized that I work in series, and I kind of trust the process that the series will reveal themselves. And um, I, I wasn't painting little buildings a year ago, and I wouldn't have said that I would be. So it's kind of evolved to this. And I just follow my heart. They're not terribly planned. Okay, let's go to the... Uh, 1985, right? 86. Is that when I started it? Go ahead. Um, in 1986, I went to a World Peace Conference, actually here in Amsterdam. And um, I saw Jerry Jampolsky at the conference. He was at the conference, Rodrigo Carrazzo, Robert Mueller. And it was um, the 50-year anniversary of the United Nations. And I had brought with me um, a little postcard called Seeing Eye to Eye that I felt I wanted to donate to a Peace Institute or a Peace Academy. And I was introduced to Rodrigo. And he um, said that it would be wonderful to have that piece at the University for Peace. That's where I wanted it. And so I offered it to them. And he came and stayed at our home in Hawaii about three or four months later when he was coming through Hawaii. And at dinner one night, he said, you know, Andrea, your work is oriented towards peace. Maybe you need to emphasize that it is art for peace. And so as a result, I started doing the calendar art for peace as a way to share the work with many people. and. Um, I realized that any time I wanted to join an, a peace movement involving art, it was usually art against war, not art for peace. And so I felt that I wanted my work to be observational meditations and messages about peace within, peace on earth. And um, so this is our 13th year of doing it. So you, you change the images every year then? I change the images every year. So is it interpretations as well? So you have something written in there? All of the paintings are interpreted because I realize that they're um, a little different and they're definitely messages and I, I understand the meaning of them. So I make it very simple for people to understand what I'm trying to say. Why don't you show us some of those images? Okay, does the cover show up yes. okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, the cover, this painting is, um, actually what is the title of it? You know the title, it would make it easier. Circle of Light, Circle of Wisdom. Circle of Light, Circle of Wisdom. And um, I painted this before I knew about this conference. And it's uh, kind of auspicious because it's a circle of elders holding the light and the wisdom for the planet. The two pillars on the side represent wisdom. And the people in the center represent the elders in a circle of light. Um, all around the top are all of the different religions on the earth represented. There's Buddhism and Christianity and Judaism. All of the different religions. Um, and the idea is that we have to hold the energy and we have to hold the vision for the kind of a planet we want. Um, it's very easy to get caught up in the negative. So the people that are understanding this are the ones that have to hold the light. And those are the elders. And I do believe that there are many holding the light with prayer, with meditation, and just with deep intention of wanting a different kind of world. So that's what that pa plant, uh, painting is. It's like kind of Egyptian characters there. Yeah, I, I go to Egypt all the time. But I've always painted Egyptian um, headdresses long before I started going to Egypt. So maybe a carryover from another life. Okay, what else you got to show us? Mm, this is a good one. <laughs> this one is caught, wait, it's not, maybe it's easier to do it like this. Is it easier to do it that way? Okay. okay, this one is called the Heart of Peace, and um, this represents Mother Earth, 
the female with um, olive the green, and father sky. And it's the balance on the earth, basically, of um, holding that kind of peace, knowing that we're surrounded by lots of angels, lots of support, but it's the feeling that we're sharing this earth with all of these different kinds of people. Those rainbow people represent all of the different cultures. Which are the rainbow people? The rainbow people are the ones that are surrounding the heart in the very center. Okay. In the very, very center of the piece is a, a face that in all of my paintings represents the feeling of peace. To me, it's the way my children looked when they were babies sleeping. And I've always remembered that very peaceful little face. But to me, it always represents peace. And so it's the earth at the center. So the center represents the earth at peace, um, the fish, swimming around in the water, the trees, a golden uh, ring of wisdom around the earth, and then all of the different cultures, which I represent by rainbow-colored people. And that is the heart of healing, seeing the earth in that way, in a very holistic way. Knowing that Mother Earth and Father Sky are completely supporting us. So it's kind of like a new Earth mythology, a new Mother Earth mythology. And then the cherubs that are on the bottom and the top and the little angel um, represent all of the support that we have if we focus on the light. It's invisible, but it's there and very present. So that's what it represents. And the dark background just means that we have to really be open to the universe. It's full of infinite possibilities. Next. Called the inner journey. Um, I really feel that the only way out is within. And at the very bottom of the painting, it shows um, two faces facing themselves. So the only way out is within, and we have to face ourselves, go within, see the light that we truly are, and the love that we are. Um, and as we do that process, we raise our own energy, we become light beings, and we feel at peace. Our being expands, and we feel the light, and we feel very supported. So. This, to me, is the most important journey of all, the inner journey, um, because that's the way that we take the peace out into the world, after we find it within ourselves. And blue is traditionally felt to be the color of peace. So just the color of the peace um, kind of gives that feeling also. I love this one. It's called um, Father and Son. And I think the reason I love it so much is because I've always painted mother and child paintings and uh, focused on Mother Earth and just mothers and children and lots of female um, imagery, only because I'm a woman and that's what I know best. And this piece represented the feeling that fathers have for their children. They don't love their children any less than mothers love their children. And every father's hopes and dreams for their son. So this was a father and son painting, um, kind of depicting the story of everything this father would love to give to his child. His visions of the future, his hopes for humanity, um, the intricate patterns and the rainbow blend of people and all of the wisdom that we have to offer, and um, basically all of the love that this father would love to give, which I feel is the intention of so many people. And somehow we don't always fulfill those dreams. But this is the ideal form of what you would want to offer your child. This, I don't 
fabric feel here in the middle. This is a series of fabrics. Tell me about that. Then there's this. It's a story. And so coming out of the, um, actually from the bottom, there's a line of animals. There's a line of people. They're outlined in gold. It's the dark part. And it's part of the story that this father is telling his child about how the universe is within, how we're all interconnected. All of the animals, all of the people are made out of the same matter, really, just organized in different ways. And as the dark goes into different patterns, it's the patterns that we weave over lifetimes. Um, this person knowing that they're karmically linked to this child and that they've woven patterns over lifetimes that they're working out now or um, spiritually working on now. And so that's what the patterns represent. And then as the most central part, the face, which represents the only really important part is, is the peace that you have within, um, who you help along the way and is basically all that really counts. And so what you offer to people in the form of peace is what's so important. And this father is also imparting that to his child, along with explaining that we're all connected, that that rainbow blend of humanity at the top really represents the way the planet is. Many, many different cultures learning to live together. This um, painting represents a prayer for humanity. Um, it's actually a prayer for the Middle East. The figures in gold. Should I wait? This painting is called Gathering of the Wisdom. The gold figures represent the um, people of the planet holding the wisdom, holding the light. The different colored buildings in the background and the different shapes represent all of the different cultures. And it was really a prayer for the Middle East. Um, I go to Egypt all the time, and I have many friends in the Middle East, and they want peace as much as I want peace. They love their kids as much as I love my kids. And they have no desire to have uh, fighting either. And so this was a prayer to kind of heal all of the um, terrible feelings that lots of people were having um, about that part of the world. And remember, these are our sisters and brothers, too. And they're incredibly beautiful people. So this was done specifically as a prayer for that part of the world. Any particular reason why in that painting you have the figures as just silhouettes without any detail, whereas in your other paintings you have more detail? Um, well, sometimes I do these figures in other paintings, too, but in this paint particular painting, it totally represented holding wisdom, just that there's an incredible amount of wisdom, and it doesn't matter what shape or size or color or any of those things, really, that um, what's inside of us is all that really counts. Something about that tier of buildings behind. Mm-hmm. Those... They do or do not? Um, well, it's not necessarily Middle Eastern. It represents all the different cultures. The more I travel, the more I pay atten attention to the rooftops. And the thing that is different in different countries are the rooftops, the way they, um, you know, there's domes, or in Egypt you see pyramids, uh, minarets. So that's more what it represents. All of these different rooftops to me represent all of the different cultures and the creativity and the shapes and the as an artist, I see everything in shapes and designs. So that's what made its impression on me. The stone is old, the arches are old, but the building tops look like that. Ready? What do the figures represent? Well, no, tell me about the whole thing. Okay, well, the title of it is called Mother Nurture. And the reason it's called Mother Nurture is because it's about the feminine, healing, nurturing vibration that we all have. Um, men have it too, not just women.
but it's that part of us that's just really the nurturing part. And so this represents um, all of the nurturing that that energy does. These are women with children and the kind of love and nurturing that they're getting. And that if we don't get that kind of feeling, it's very difficult to share that kind of feeling. And so that's why it's so important that we experience that kind of tenderness or care or gentleness, that loving kind of vibration that this painting represents. And so, and it's multicultural. Um, wherever I travel, I realize that love is very universal. It's not exclusive to any one country or nation or group of people. It's very universal and it's all the same. I, I haven't met one mother who has said, yep, take my kid and send him off to war. Uh, not even one. And I haven't met, um, I, all of the people that I've met just want the best, really, for their children. They just want them to be safe and healthy and happy. So this is representing that care and gentleness. Your adult figures uh, tend not to have eyes. You have a precise intentional Yes. Yes. Well, I used to do very um, detailed, realistic paintings, and as my spiritual path changed, so did my paintings. And when I began to realize that the only way out was within, that inner peace started inside, um, it was nothing in the outside world that gave it to us. I just closed the eyes on most of my paintings, and um, and then they like just disappeared. <laughs> Other than the peaceful one, most of them just disappeared. There isn't anything out there that we see with our eyes that's all that important. Extraordinary statement from a visual artist. Mm -hmm. Say that again. Well, I was saying that I closed the eyes because I realized that it all came from within. And they're all looking off to the side in this thing. Well, you know, this is also very uh, Egyptian. After going to Egypt all these times, I realized it's very Egyptian. I, had n I didn't really know about it until I went, but in Egyptian art, they, they traditionally posed people sideways and put their shoulders forward because it looked better. And I intuitively just do that. So I just thought they were dancing, but they're very Egyptian looking. Okay, you got some kind of, uh, you put the whole thing that was looked at you. Okay. Is that something to tell us about uh, the role of art and bringing peace, or your what kind of uh, what it's done for you? Well, through my art, I truly have um, learned an awful lot about inner peace. When you work alone um, in pretty much silence, other than with music, you begin to pay attention to your thinking. And I noticed that if my thoughts weren't very clear when I would paint a little peaceful face, it didn't look very peaceful. It kind of had a sneer. And um, so I began to see that anything I had inside of me was going to come through in my art. And I made um, a commitment a long time ago. Um, I was pregnant with our first child during the Vietnam War. And I remember sitting with my hands on top of my stomach watching the war on TV and then having a baby a few days later and watching TV and watching the same war. And I decided that I had to do something because I didn't want to give this baby boy to any war for any fighting, for any reason. And so I just started to pray what I could do. And it took many, many years to get the answer, but the answer was find inner peace. And so that's and I was always an artist. I taught school for 10 years, but I was always an artist. And so I went back to my art. I went back to my art and um, after teaching school for 10 years. And the realism that used to make me happy and I enjoyed wasn't fun anymore. And after having children and going through the 60s and all of these uh, experiences, I decided that I had to express what I was feeling. And so I just played for many years. And finally, I started to do something I liked. And um, a workshop that I'm teaching now is called Square One, which really teaches people how to play again. We kind of forget, after we're not kids anymore, we just pick up a crayon and color that we still have the same freedom. Um, we shut it off. And so this workshop I'm doing is kind of getting people back in touch with just playing, telling their left brain to take a hike and letting their right brain have a little fun. Yeah.
Well, I wonder if we could start by asking Jerry very quickly to summarize the main turning points that you have undergone in your life that have brought you to this point and to the incredible work that you've done for peace and healing in the world. Well, it was in 1975. Uh, I had been going through a very difficult divorce and uh, I was in great pain. I, I turned to alcohol, killing myself with alcohol, yet afraid to die. And uh, I read a one page in a book that made a, a tremendous change. It was a book called A Course in Miracles. And uh, I heard a little voice inside say, Physician, heal thyself. This is your way home. And I experienced a, a feeling of oneness with God that somehow my work was going to be God's work. Totally different than my materialistic way of looking at the world at that time. And a few days later, I was at a hospital where a child was asking, what's it like to die? And the doctor didn't answer him. And I had some guidance then to start a center for children who were suffering from catastrophic illness, and that these children would be like wise spirits and young bodies teaching me and other volunteers another way of looking at life, another way of looking at death. And it started to change my life completely. Uh, we started the center based on spiritual principles, Center for Attitudinal Healing in California. And the uh, whole aspect was, as we learn to help another person, we help ourselves that the essence of our being is spirit, uh, that we learn to listen to the inner voice of God tell us what to think, say, and do. And so our whole work is what I call practical spirituality. Uh, and uh, my life has never been more joyful uh, than it is today because uh, I'm living a life of, of giving and, and, and joyfulness uh, by the, the work that, that we do. And um, I realize that each of us make a difference. Uh, and uh, everything we do is on an equality basis. Uh, we believe that everyone's an equal teacher and student to each other. So the, the, if we're in a business organization, we think the janitor is just as important as the president of the organization in terms of uh, recognizing their importance and their love. And I would stop there and let Diane continue, I think. Thank you, Jerry. Well, the, uh, as Jerry said, when the work started in 1975, there was actually no such thing as the word support group mm. in our vernacular. Mm. And people sort of forget that, and so it was quite experimental. But it expanded from the children to their brothers and sisters who wanted their own groups, children who had their own issues, uh, to their parents, and also to uh, children whose parents were life-threatened or had died, healthy children. And then in 1982, we expanded on working with AIDS, so that's been about 17 years now. And then the work has expanded to many other groups, breast cancer, etc. And perhaps the largest growing group now is the person-to-person -person program, where people who don't have life-threatened illnesses come together to use these principles in all aspects of their lives. It's beautiful. And can I ask you both, if you looked back over the work that you've been doing in this last 25 years, what are the highest most significant moments for you each that have given you the most joy, the most love, the most excitement, and the deepest spirit? That's a lovely question. I don't know if anyone's ever asked us that. Mm. <laughs> um, I always think it's um, being in the moment, uh, not comparing it with other moments, but this moment being with you, having an opportunity to, to open the door to our, so reminding ourselves what we want to do in terms of uh, letting go of any kind of judgments. Uh, practicing forgiveness and uh, extending love. So uh, each moment is, is, is as important a, 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 as another. And um, what we really do is, is help open a door for people to decide, to choose for themselves, uh, whether they want to be in conflict, whether they want to be in peace, and to, and to point out that it is a, a, a choice. Do they want to experience love or fear? And uh, we have a friend, uh, Hugh Prather, that uh, made it pretty clear how people can come in contact with that. And you might want to share that story, Diane, about putting a TV monitor on, on your head. Um, well, we often think that our thoughts are very private, and so we sort of have a tremendous conflict inside our own minds, thinking that no one else understands you know, what's going on so we can hide it and have a different facade. And he talks about the possibilities of everyone having a TV monitor on top of their heads, uh, which uh, broadcast every single thought that they had all the time, so that everyone's thoughts were projected out at every moment. And so the thought is, 
that we have the belief system that our, our thoughts are private, but in reality there's many ways that our thoughts are shown to others. And so it's about taking personal responsibility for what you think, you know, and what you say, and what you do. So let me make that more clear. If everyone did have that TV camera in our imagination, we would probably do a great deal to clean out the negative thoughts and just having thoughts of, of, of love. So if I were going to be at your conference, your international conference that's going to be held um, in, in the summer, uh, I would be saying that it's really important uh, to, 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 to let go of uh, trying to change other people. Uh, it's really important to be aware of uh, where you're not forgiving another person or where you're not forgiving yourself and to uh, choose to see people differently, either as loving or that they're fearful of giving us a call of help for love. And uh, when we do that, uh, something different happens. And we can just remember that uh, forgiveness is really the greatest healer of all. And as we heal our own minds and become more peaceful, within our own hearts and our own minds, then the world we see begins to be different. And that's the best way I know of creating a different world with a new vision where there's only love and not, not fear. I would say that the highest moments for me are when I have experienced um, attitudinal healing, um, working in a way that has, um, it has no script. It's, it, 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 um, people choose to use these principles in their lives as a way of, um, of healing themselves. So attitude and healing is not about someone else, it's about yourself. And what it does is it, each of us, by uh, helping others, we're helping ourselves, in creating safe enough, healthy enough environments for each other in a support group model, allows us to um, uh, create for ourselves and someone else the opportunity to really, really explore deeply those things that those blocks that keep us from experiencing peace of mind. And uh, to us, peace of mind and inner peace has nothing to do with being passive. In fact, it's probably the most active force yeah. in the world. Absolutely. It doesn't mean, yeah. you know, we don't have any form for how we are on the outside. Attitudinal healing is all about personal transformation and about how you do the work inside, taking complete responsibility for your life, how you experience everything, including the war in Bosnia, every person that you meet, etc., as well as healing the relationships in your own mind. And um, it's always a choice. There's never a script. So that's why it it works well in all cultures. We have worked in 49 countries uh, to date, and Islamic countries, Catholic, all different faiths, all different cultures, with Aboriginal and indigenous peoples, and it, it applies everywhere. And so they recognize it really as their own. So I think that what attitudinal healing is are really very ancient principles put in contemporary terms, and someone in the field of psychiatry and psychology is able to sort of articulate it so people think that it's Oh, well, this is perfect, what I need right now. And in reality, it's really about remembering. Our work helps people remember who they are. It's not about Jerry Jambolsky. It's not about me. It's yeah. about yeah. how people choose to use this. That's the most inspiring part to me, is how people choose to use this work in their lives. Andrew, there are no accidents. and I'm going to ask for your flexibility right now. And uh, an angel has come here uh, in, in, in the name of a mother of a young lady we worked with. Uh, where uh, really miraculous things have happened. And I just feel if we had a chance to let her share her brief story, that would be helpful to the listeners here. So I'm going to ask you to change places and, uh, uh, and uh, ask if you just come for a few minutes. Come on, you it, it would be very... Okay. Maybe soon. No, you do. Yeah. I'll hold the sharing. Okay. I'll hold the sharing. Uh, look all you have. <laughs> Uh, uh, an old friend has come uh, here to see us at this conference uh, uh, to say thank you. We really need to say thank you to her. But could you introduce yourself and give us your name? Ich bin Astrid Gruber aus Düsseldorf in Deutschland. And uh, the story, just briefly, is that her daughter uh, had a terrible horseback riding accident where she's totally paralyzed. From the waist down. From the waist yeah. down. And uh, was told that she would uh, never walk again. Uh, and her mother, who had read a number of our books, uh, began to use these books with the whole family about uh, believing in miracles, uh, believing that uh, uh, what's really important is inner peace, and oftentimes peace, uh, your body begins to change. And about six months later, her little toe began to move. Uh, she began to be on, uh, on crutches and is uh, now attending a university in, uh, in, uh, in, Cambridge, in, in, in Cambridge. And uh, 
we, we've seen many miracles happen and now she's helping other children and other people who have had uh, uh, paralyzed uh, conditions too. And it's from your own heart uh, about, about this. Ich hatte diesen Kurs im Wundern oder die Bücher von Jerry Jampolski schon vorher gelesen und an dem Bett von Maren, von meiner Tochter, als sie so aufbegehrte und ihre Beine nicht bewegen konnte und ihre Füße, da fiel mir diese, eine Geschichte besonders ein von einem kleinen elfjährigen Jungen. Und das war der Beginn für meine Tochter, ähm, ja, sich sehr dafür zu interessieren, was ist dieser Kurs in Wundern und wer ist dieser Jerry Jampolski. Und nach einigen Wochen sagte sie dann, ich möchte da in diesem Zentrum in Sosilito äh, ein Praktikum machen. Ja, soweit. <lacht> Thank you. So, uh, it was uh, one person's faith that there must be another way. And uh, as uh, the family became healed in their interaction, uh, letting go of being angry at God, uh, letting go of being angry at the world and, and brought uh, spirit into their life, Uh, a whole different uh, life began to happen for them. So I think their message, uh, for sure, to never give hope, uh, never give hope for peace, and to know that out of even a terrible situation like this, uh, there are positive lessons God would have us learn. And that lesson always is a way of finding ourselves to become closer to God. And one of the ways to become closer to God in our work, and what gives Di and I this joy, is that when you're in a consciousness of giving and not judging, then we begin to feel the peace of God. Translate what she said, for, please, when she spoke. Give an approximate idea. Shall, shall we do it afterwards? No, do no, I want it right here on the tape, right now. I recommend that. Oh, um... Um, well, I oh, yeah, just a moment here. Yeah. Don't, don't bother coming yet, but would you film? I only have the gist. I didn't... We could do it, David. After they were going to put the words on it. Are you going to put the words on? You're sure you do that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 You want to ask some other questions? Yes. Okay. Um, two questions. The first one is, um, I showed you a magazine always, in which we attempt to bring thousands of people to focus their unconditional love, their silent support, their prayer, on a place in the world which needs great healing. Uh, we've focused on Chechnya, this currently on uh, Robert Muller gave us some suggestions about how to focus for Sudan. Next one is likely to be for Kosovo and I wondered whether I might invite you to um, offer or be a guest peacemaker for that and offer a two minute technique that people can do which will, in your opinion, be the most effective thing they can do in that two minute time that would actually make a difference. Like yes, I think I can, I can offer one. I'd like to offer to you what uh, Jerry and I do every morning um, in our lives. I think Jerry, that would be a yeah, then suggestion. Maybe I could add to that. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, part of it is that once one gets quiet and clear inside, um, first the healing of the self to see light inside the individual, inside yourself, any places that may need healing. And then um, uh, in our minds, to think of anyone we have an unhealed relationship with, to see the face of that person in your mind with your eyes closed, light around it with a meditation of saying, I thank you for what you've taught me and I thank myself. I forgive you and I forgive myself. And as you're doing that, the face is getting smaller, the light is getting larger. And then I release you and I release myself to the point of light. So forgiving yourself, taking care of yourself, taking care of others. Also then seeing an image of the globe and people all over the globe in these highlight points. One can create their own visualization about that and sending all of your energy to that person. And maybe Jerry would like to add to that. Yes, to forgive the media today because the, the media in its selection of what it puts on papers and on the film, tends to make us want to find a villain, someone to blame. So we're either blaming the premier in, in, in Yugoslavia, or we're blaming NATO, or blaming Clinton. And I think it's really important in our prayers not to blame anyone. And to see anyone that uses violence, whether it's violence against their wives or violence against someone's husband or violence against another nation, that that person is really suffering from lack of love. 
And what they really need is not our punishment, but they need our love. So it's really to send light to these people and not exclude our light from anyone in this conflict. And to see that light coming through us, that we're here to receive that light, but to see the light in everyone. And even though behavior may be abhorrible, to know that there is an innocent child in, in that person who is suffering, or they wouldn't be making these kind of decisions. And our job is to not only send light and love in our prayers to them, but to remind ourselves that we don't want to have any hurtful thoughts in our own mind about anyone in our family or our extended family, and that we want to send light and love to everyone and to exclude no one. So along with the love comes responsibility, responsibility for all of our own actions and thoughts, also knowing that every other person is very responsible for what they do. The difference in this type of justice versus the justice that I'm angry and I'm going to come to your angry situation and condemn you is that we first do our own homework and then we ask a higher source, what is it I need to think and say and do about the situation? And then when we ask and call for justice, which we need to, because I think to be a socially responsible person, you know, you need to, to be a spiritual person, you need to be socially conscious, as Gandhi said. Mm -hmm. And when you call for justice, it's a clearer, cleaner ju justice. Thanks. And then each person is distinctly responsible for what they do in the world. And I think that instead of doing exactly what the perpetrators are doing, going up or going up or murdering and killing, that we need first to do our own work and then hold a place for justice. Absolutely. Beautiful. And, uh, Savitri, I know you want to ask a question. Um, I have one which I think David also might appreciate. Have you got time for us to ask you two questions? Yeah? Yes. The first one then, I'll ask this if that's all right. Um, the greatest thing I think about the work that you've both been doing is that you have enabled groups to start all around the world. And these groups have themselves created peace in the lives of the people who've mm. been in those groups in a very deep way. Mm. Well, let me just make one correction that we haven't actually started those groups. People have been inspired by the work, and which is even, I think, more powerful, that they themselves have decided to start it. And we are in support of that, and our center is in support of that, and off all the services of all the centers are free mm. around the world. But that people are inspired themselves. They get the ideas. We don't give them the ideas. Mm. I well, I th you might have given part of the answer. The question was, what is necessary for such a group to start? What are the main conditions that uh, a facilitator of such a group needs to cultivate within themselves and within the people of the group in order for it to successfully continue? And I'm partly asking this with the mind of the people we work with in um, Chechnya or Bosnia or the Sudan, who will themselves start up self-help groups after we've gone. And I'd like to give them some advice from you about what they can do to keep themselves going. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just start to give you an example. Um, about five years ago, we received a fax from a lawyer in, uh, in Zagreb, uh, Croatia, having read a number of our books, saying, we need to have some of this attitude and healing in our country. We have a quarter of a million refugees, and we need to do something about Could it to help them, too. Could you come and help? And we said yes. And uh, uh, speaking to various uh, groups, uh, hospitals, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, Red Cross. Uh, following that, uh, we invited uh, about five people, uh, gave scholarships to them to come to have training uh, and attitude of healing in, in our country. Uh, then they went back, and then uh, we were able to get a grant to support them uh, so that uh, uh, for maybe three years, uh, once a month, a, a new person from our staff would be there with them. And what we do is give people the permission to enable themselves to work without having to be dependent on another person. We help people get empowered. A lot of people go over there, but when the money runs up, the structure goes away and it falls down. Our job is to do ourselves out of a job. Yes. That's a sign of a good teacher. So now uh, the Croatia Center has expanded. They have many uh, satellite uh, groups going, going on uh, around uh, Croatia. Uh, in Bosnia. In Bosnia. Bosnia. Uh, they're actually doing workshops in different, other, in different other parts of, of, of the world. And uh, people are coming there. Through that, uh, Di and I were invited uh, to uh, participate in a very special conference with uh, 30 uh, spiritual leaders and religious leaders of Bosnia last summer, in the summer of 1998 around reconciliation and forgiveness, mm -hmm. where they were still having problems uh, with uh, and, and doing. Uh, so I think if one, my advice would be that if you are inspired, 
uh, by attitudinal healing. Uh, there are a number of books uh, that uh, are, might be a first Letting Go of Fear, uh, Change Your Mind, Change Your Life. Uh, our center is in, uh, the Mother Center is in California, and uh, okay. it's called the Center for Attitude and Healing in, uh, in Sausalito, California. The phone number there is uh, 415-331-6161, and the uh, fax number is uh, 331-4545. Uh, and uh, we now have begin to have satellite groups where some of our people can go wherever they are and help do a workshop so people don't have to travel that long that long uh, distance. But the most important thing to remember about attitude and healing is its cost effectiveness because uh, by and large each center is, is run by, 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 by uh, volunteers. And, uh, and there are some centers that we don't have a center. They, they have like a, once in, in Holland, for example, uh, they have about uh, 20. 22 different attitudinal healing groups ha taking place in different people's houses throughout the country. As well as in prisons yeah. and in the state hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, and this person was inspired that started th this one uh, th uh, named Els, who uh, said, this is what I want as my life work right now. And so it's a matter of really asking God what it is I'm to do. And if this stimulates you, then, then the next step would be to say nothing's impossible. Go ahead and do it. But we need to heal ourselves in that process. So um, in addition to the about 120 centers there are now in uh, about 29 countries, um, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of groups of people doing this. And what does it take? I think in the simpler version of what Jerry said, it just takes two people that want to come together and use these principles to practice them in their own lives. And that really is the beginning of it. And from then on, it just has its own form. Mm. Beautiful. Well, uh, I could ask you for hours on this topic, but I won't at the moment. <laughs> Savitri, would you like to ask a question? Uh, I would like to summarize before you do that, though. Yeah. And say that, you know, in a real summary way, that love is the answer regardless of the question, regardless of the economical situation, that regardless of whatever the problem is in our lives, to remember that unconditional love is always the answer and that it's really important that we see that we deserve to be happy and that happiness really depends not on the external aspects of our lives, but on the internal aspects of our lives and our connection with God. Well, I'll add to that definition though that unconditional love also doesn't mean supporting another person's insane behavior. <laughs> Attitudinal healing uh, shares with us the concept that unconditional love is a way of cleaning up our own judgments and our own perceptions, taking complete responsibility for our own thoughts, then coming to the situation and saying, what do I need to think, say, and do? And in that way, we are able to unconditionally love someone from an internal place and then ask how the appropriate form is that. It may be a call for justice. It may be saying no. It means healthy responses, but not out of our own anger and rage and pain that's still unresolved, but out of the resolved place of feeling connectedness and calling for clarity. And then the action is much more powerful. So this form of unconditional love and inner peace, etc., is extremely powerful and strong in the world. In fact, it can't Did come as unconditional love until that condition is satisfied, is it? Well, <laughs> that's definitely one <laughs> way to say it. Another question over here. Dan and, and Jerry, what, what I would like to say is that increasingly we find ourselves with our work in um, the political circles. And by the way, we're, my main area is in detraumatization. And I worked with one of your centers in Zagreb. We gave some workshops there. And most people who were at our workshop were, oh yes, we do, we do attitudinal healing. We're from Gerald John Polsky. Everywhere, you know, we find that we bump into your people. And they're beautiful. They are great. Um, if you want to see what you can do, you can And so, you know, your, your people are around the globe and spreading that which you, which you live. Increasingly, a responsibility, as you say, to, you know, to make a difference, to make an effect. You have to speak their language, you have to meet people where they're at. What would your advice be to if you if you were in a room and you had thirty the top? What would you say to them that's going to make a difference? That's going to meet them where they are, but lift them and just maybe push push them along a little bit faster.
process of separation is created by saying that you're right. First, as we have. else's attitude but in reality the work is really about each of us doing our own individual work and taking that responsibility and we we try to stay we actually do accomplish staying out of taking a a view you might say and taking sides with someone we've actually been involved in this question uh, our job uh, is not to tell politicians what to do or think we know better what to do uh, but we do ask them uh, does their belief system and what they're doing in terms of how they're being so hostile to their political opponents really bringing them peace? And very frequently they say no, and then they say, well, are you interested in another way of looking at that? And very frequently they say, they say yes, and so uh, we have been uh, doing workshops uh, with people in government uh, who are interested uh, in finding another way of looking at the world, another way of looking at themselves, and a recognition, really, that politics is not going to solve problems, that will not solve problems on this level, that we need to go to a higher level. And going to that spiritual level within politics uh, is a, another way of beginning to solve problems. Let me give you a small example. We work with in the Yukon Territories in Canada with indigenous peoples there, the First Nation people. There's about 14 bands there. We've worked with about six of them. And one of them was having an election, the, uh, the Kaska First Nation people, uh, the second election in their history. And their first chief who was elected was a woman, Chief Ann Bain. And then when the second election came, um, her brother in the tribe um, decided to run, which made her very feel very, very hurt, feel unsupported, and he was hurt because he didn't, he didn't know why she didn't understand. And so as we were there with them, uh, working with them, they had asked us if we thought there could be any solution. And we said, we didn't know, but let's sit down together. And then we asked her what her goal was, and she said, my goal is to have peace within the tribe and also to do a good job running. And he said, my goal is peace also. And we said, well, what if during the campaign, which lasts one month in their tribe, what if when you, um, Anne, were uh, campaigning and people asked you about your opponent, that you said, um, he was my brother before, which is what she had said earlier to us, he's my brother before this campaign, he's my brother during this campaign, and he'll be my brother afterwards. And if he were chief, he would be a good chief. And if I were chief, this is what I would offer to you, and vice versa. They both agreed and they made a pact that if the one was elected, they would employ the other one in the government. Because you see, they both had very good points, but they were very different. One was for health, one was for education and development, economics and development. And they did it. And she wound up winning, and he came and worked for her. And they found another way of looking at the world. That was attitudinal healing. So it's being like Gandhi, being fearless and just bringing spirituality into the arena. Well, it's more than just that. It's making that your total commitment. And uh, if we're making a difference, I think it has something to do with the people that are involved in attitude healing and say, this is my total commitment of wanting peace of God. And it's not just attitude healing, it's just making that difference. And I think there are no accidents that a miracle is a coincidence in which God wishes to remain anonymous. And uh, we have a man listening to us that just came up that I think the energy brought in here, the Peace Pilgrim number two, and uh, he really demonstrates to me, and I hope to your listeners, um, what listening to the inner voice means. Uh, here's a man who, like the Peace Pilgrim, decided that uh, I'm here really to make a difference. He didn't let money get in the way because his guidance was to give his money away, as the Peace Pilgrim had been. And uh, to walk around the world with the total goal of being a messenger of peace. And I think it would be of interest if you had a couple of minutes to just ask him to, to share uh, his, uh, if you'd be willing to, to, to do that. But uh, while you're sitting down, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that uh, uh, we, uh, they, just did a, they just did a documentary on the Peace Pilgrim, yes, number one, mm -hmm. and uh, we were interviewed uh, in that, they were part of that documentary. Uh, and uh, the Peace Pilgrim has always been a, a model of, of ours about uh, how one person can make a difference by listening to the inner voice and letting the rational mind go away mm -hmm. and knowing and having that kind of trust and faith as she did. And before she died, she was being interviewed on television uh, and she was quite well at that time. And uh, 
how can you, the interviewer says, how can you be so happy, you know, when you've given all your money away, you never know what, how that day's going to end, where you're going to live, where you're going to get money. And she said, well, it's very easy. I don't have any junk thoughts, and I don't eat any junk food. <laughs> it was that simple. She gave up all of her judgments. So if you really want to find a happy person, you'll find someone who's given up all their judgments. Why don't you just share briefly how you made your decision to be a Peace Pilgrim number two? Yeah, and first introduce yourself, and uh, within about two minutes, how you decided and what it means sure. to you. Give me your name first. Well, I, um, your name? Uh, I'm known as Peace Pilgrim now. People call me Peace. And um, what happened, I got a calling that this is what I needed to do, and I didn't want to do it, and I fought it for about 10 days and nights. And finally, I think I gave in because I needed some sleep. And so I, uh, I became a peace pilgrim. And um, I and love... what has that meant for you? Uh, it's meant that it's given me an opportunity. I, I have two, th two things. I'm, n I'm not a great... I don't have PhDs and doctorates, but I have an English accent, which I had nothing to do with. I was born in England. And I have a lot of love because I was given a lot of love. And that gives me the opportunity to share that love with people because unfortunately so many people are brought up in dysfunctional homes and have never even received love and so they uh, can only act from where they know and uh, my hope is that I can share uh, that they can make a difference by changing their feelings and, um, and coming from a loving place and I think that love is the only thing in the, mis in the world that is missing if we had love and we loved ourselves first and then one another uh, I couldn't rob you, I couldn't cheat you, I couldn't, certainly couldn't rape you or murder you or kill mm -hmm. or even make guns or bombs or uh, let alone use them. So love is what's missing and if, uh, since I have it, uh, I, I have so much of it inside of me, if I don't share it, I'm going to explode. So it's a selfish <laughs> reason <laughs> that I do this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could not only s call you peace, yes. but your name now is peace, yes. your name is love, yes. and we addressed each other in that way, but I, I really want to acknowledge your faith and trust Thank you. and commitment because mm -hmm. uh, it inspires, I'm sure, everyone that will hear this small uh, videotape that they too can make a difference. Absolutely. But you had to do this by not paying attention to what other people were telling you because they thought maybe you were crazy to give your money away and, and just trust in this way. I've been uh, interviewed and t they've asked me, don't people sometimes think you're crazy doing this? And I say, yes. And if the world out there is sane, I'm very happy to be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we have to make the difference. Yeah. Can I share with you, my, I'm a psychiatrist. Yes, I know you well. And uh, you know, you know, okay, well, then if I were to redo the big book that tells people what kind of psychiatric diagnosis they have, yeah. it'd be one line. And being crazy means not experiencing yourself as love and giving that love away. So you're probably one of the, one of the few sane people around here. Because most totally, of us are insane most of the you're, time. You're, 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 uh, that means most of us are insane most of the because you're, you're really walking your pathway. It's been worse. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, if people say, I can't change, it's too difficult to yeah. change. And I say it's too difficult not to change because more of the same just gives mm -hmm. us more of the same. Mm -hmm. And whatever we put out, it's going to have an effect. And so I don't, I want to be happy. I can't be happy if I'm mad, angry, upset, and, and in turmoil. Well, you're a wonderful so example of that. And let me just add that you don't have to wear this peace shirt to f let people know, because we just look in your eyes, and we see your peace, and we see your happiness. And, 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 and we thank you, you for that. you have it that you recognize it, otherwise you couldn't <laughs> see it. Oh. Thank, thank so you for that. that. Thank you yeah. very much for including me. And yeah. thank you all, if we can conclude, and uh, just a, yeah. a parting message for all of you at the conference. And, um, we're uh, just learning about the work now, and we're very, you know, proud to uh, become more familiar with it. It seems like a wonderful extension, and uh, we'd like a to interface with you in any way yes, that we can with the work in attitudinal healing because it's it's a lovely compliment, and we all know that we're all here for our own healing, and so we join you in that journey. Tremendous.